Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our second reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Before the sermon, I'll just reread the last two verses where Paul writes, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So far, God's word. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who redeemed us, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent sufferings and death, dear Christian friends. Well, what a change six months or so can make. If six months ago, in the sermon I had referenced Charlie Rose, you would have said, oh, Charlie Rose, he's the uh, host of the CBS Morning News. Seems like a nice enough guy. If six months ago I had referenced Matt Lauer, you would have said, oh, Matt Lauer, he's the very popular host of the Today Show. And six months ago, if I had referenced in the sermon Harvey Weinstein, you would have said, oh, head of the Weinstein Corporation uh, and executive producer of so many movies that I enjoy. What a change six months can bring, huh? Mentioned Charlie Rose, Matt Lauer, Harvey Weinstein. And maybe the same thought pops into your head that pops into many people's thoughts these days. What a, cup, what a bunch of scumbags. Boy, I'm glad that the truths come out about them. Glad that as they are disgraced, they're getting what they deserve. And hopefully, they won't be able to hurt any more women. Of course, they're hardly the only ones, right? In the world of sports, in the world of politics, it seems name after name comes out. Some names, you just shake your head and say, oh no, not that one too. It's getting to the point where people are saying, oh, well, when does this all end? Well, as Christians who have a perspective on human sinfulness and history, we're able to answer that question, when will it end? Uh, the, the simple answer is, it isn't. <laughs> it's not going to end. Not, not until Jesus himself comes down and makes it end. Oh, it may get tamped down for a time, but... Sin is sin, and sin will keep rearing its ugly head. Yes. Not even Christians are immune from this sin. But the truth is, theoretically, it could all end. It could all end, even here in this world, if people, if everyone would simply take to heart the words of our text for this morning. And the truth of God that's contained therein. Unfortunately, since sin came into this world, people in position of, positions of power, especially men, have used those positions of power to satisfy their urges. And as long as they have done so, there have been other men and even other women who have covered up for them and enabled them because it's been advantageous for them, for these people in positions of power, to keep those positions of power. That's just the way of the world. It doesn't have to be that way, though. Not according to our text. And it certainly doesn't have to be that way in the lives of God's people. Christians, our text teaches us, Christians choose what is best for themselves and for others. Now, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthians, is writing to a group of people who are living in an era and a place that has a lot of similarities to 21st century America. If it's a desire, people said in Corinth, it's a natural desire, and you better not get in the way of people exercising their desires, fulfilling their desires. It's only natural whether we're talking about desires of the flesh or something as simple as, as Paul references in our text, the desire of the stomach to have food in it. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. One of the arguments that, that Paul argues against in, in our text. 
Well, yes, Paul says, you have that desire. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But don't forget, God's going to destroy them both. Both the food and the stomach that food goes into. Now, the thought in Corinth was, well, if I desire it, I should be able to fulfill it. Because the desire comes from inside. And so it doesn't matter how much I eat or what I eat, as long as I make myself feel better because I've eaten something that fulfills that desire. And, of course, then that carried through to relationships with adult relationships with, with, with other people. Everything is permissible for me. See, the problem that the Corinthian Christians had was that their sinful natures were taking one of the truths of the gospel and running with it in ways that God never intended. The truth of the gospel that they misused was the freedom that the gospel gives. Earlier in the children's message, we started talking just a little bit about what it would have been like to go to church in Old Testament times. Like You didn't wear your good clothes because you were bringing an animal along. And as you brought the animal to the temple courts, the priest or the Levite would hand you a knife. And either by yourself or with the help of the priest or Levite, you'd kill that animal. You'd get some of the blood of that animal on you. And all around you would be burnt animal. And the sounds of animals crying out as they were being killed. It was messy. It was disturbing. And it all carried with it a message. You know, sin costs life. Of course, none of those sacrifices actually paid for sin. They all pointed ahead to the one sacrifice that would pay for sin. And now that sacrifice has come in the person of Jesus, and Jesus has made that sacrifice. And the Corinthians were granted the grace of hearing the gospel message. God brought some of them to faith through the Holy Spirit, but they still had with them their sinful natures. And in the gospel which freed them, not only from their sins, but from all the Old Testament requirements of the law, having to offer sacrifices at certain times, having to go to Jerusalem at certain times, having to perform certain rituals at certain times, the sinful nature took that freedom and said, well, everything's permissible for me. Because even if something is truly a sin, well, we know what God does with sin, right? He, he forgives sin. And so I can sin freely because I'm going to be forgiven. Everything is permissible for me. Oh, not everything is beneficial, Paul says. Sure, I suppose you can eat whatever you want. But not everything you eat is beneficial. Just because it tastes good and fills you up doesn't mean it's going to be good for you. Choose those things that are actually going to benefit you. Paul isn't talking primarily about overeating or eating the wrong foods. And Paul isn't even primarily talking about the misuse of God's gift of sex here. He's talking about anything for which we have a desire that consumes us and makes us do things we know we ought not to do and takes our focus away from Jesus. Certainly spends a lot of time talking about the misuse of God's gift of sex here because it is a particularly harmful one. But that thought, everything is permissible for me, it forgets about the consequences of the actions that we choose. And, and, and there are consequences. And many of us have experienced those consequences in our families. When people have sinful desires and then follow through on trying to fulfill those sinful desires. And, and many of us have experienced the consequences in our own personal lives as we have fulfilled sinful desires rather than focusing on God our Savior and being content in Him. It makes you look twice then at 
the people who are being outed as predators in our society. The Harvey Weinsteins, the Charlie Roses, the Matt Lowers, and so on. Which is not to speak against justice. God loves justice. God wants people to receive justice. And it's certainly a good thing when people have, who have been hurting other people are outed and are prevented from hurting other people. But at the same time, if there's a part of us that, like the rest of the world, wants to look at these obvious sinners and tisk tisk at them and say, oh, such horrible people, we ought instead to use it as an opportunity to take a deeper look inside of ourselves. And society changes with the wind, deciding what sins are really, really bad at one particular time and what sins you can just wink at. And now, for this particular moment in time, society has decided that sins against women by men in power are really, really bad. Well, they are really, really bad, but they're not the only really bad things. And unfortunately, society hasn't always looked at those sins that way, and there will probably come a time when society does, decides they're really not all that bad again. Let's go to what God says. And the way God says things should be. Christians choose what is best for themselves and for others. Do you not know, Paul says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Now, we don't use that word temple to describe our, our places of worship. We use the word church. Maybe we should insert that instead. It'll help us understand it and apply it even better. Do you not know that your body is a church? And think of how it is a church. Let's go back to Christmas. It wasn't that long ago. On Christmas Eve, we sang one of the great Christmas stanzas that's ever been written. From Luther's great hymn, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come, Ah, dearest Jesus, holy child, make thee a bed, soft, undefiled, within my heart, that it may be a holy temple kept for thee. Come, Jesus, come and live in my heart. Well, what do we call a structure in which God lives? We call that a church. Sometimes referring to this church building, we call it God's house, right? Because this is where... The Word of God is preached. This is where the sacraments are distributed. We have the altar, the symbolic presence of God among people. If a church building like this is God's house, even more so, in a real sense, our very bodies are churches, God's houses. He lives there because he's decided to. And it's shameful that even Christians, in whom Jesus dwells, sometimes take their churches and use them to sin. And even if we haven't physically sinned with our churches, we all have sinful desires. And it's shameful that we do. But thankfully, that doesn't drive Jesus out of our hearts. That doesn't make Jesus stop wanting to be part of our lives. That doesn't keep us from being churches. Just because we misuse the church that God has given us in our bodies doesn't mean it stops being a church. It is still a church. And we remember what a church really is in the sense of a congregation. A church congregation is not a collection of the really good people in town who get together and celebrate how good they are. Like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable who raises his arms to heaven and says, I thank you that I'm not like other people. No, a church is a collection of the sinful people who come and receive forgiveness after they have unburdened themselves of the guilt of their sins by confessing those sins to God. That's what we do in this church. 
the big church, the building. That's what we do in these churches, the bodies that we have as well. Jesus comes to live with us in our hearts, not because we are such good people. He must be a part of our lives. Jesus comes because we need him as sinners to be part of our lives. It's just like we told the kids with the word holy. We are holy. Not because we're truly sinless, but because Jesus has declared us sinless, and by coming and making us his churches, he has given us purpose in how we live our lives, and purpose in the choices that we make about how we use our bodies, where we go with our bodies, what we watch, what we listen to with our bodies. Christians choose what is best for themselves and best for others with the knowledge of who they truly are. And when you get right down to it, that's the fundamental sin of someone like Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer, whoever. They don't see themselves rightly. They don't see themselves as creations of God that God means to use for a purpose here on earth. And they certainly don't see other people, especially people that they're attracted to, as creations of God that God means to use for a specific purpose. You and I do, though. We understand who we truly are and what these bodies we've been given are. They are churches in which God himself lives. And we also understand the same is true for the person sitting next to us, behind us, in front of us. Their body is a church, too. And we'd like to help them remember that in how we treat them. You are not your own, the Apostle Paul says. You were bought at a price. We referred to it at the beginning of the sermon when we quoted uh, Luther's explanation to the second article. Bought with his holy precious blood and with his innocent sufferings and death. And Luther goes on from there, that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. we're able to see the truth of who we are. Who we would be without Jesus, but who Jesus has made us in the fact that he has come to live with us. We wish for others to see the same truth about themselves. And we look at them first and foremost, not as attractive or unattractive, male or female, short or tall, but as a human being with a soul that's been redeemed by Jesus, purchased and won from all sin, death, and the power of the devil. And that influences every choice that we make in our lives here on earth. What we're going to do with our lives. How we're going to treat the bodies that we have, that, that are God's churches, how we're going to treat other people as well. We know who we are. We know what Jesus has done for us. So we as Christians will choose what is best, physically and spiritually, for ourselves, that we remain connected to him, that we keep our bodies as healthy as we're able to keep them, knowing that ultimately our health is in God's hands, but because we want to be able to serve God as best as we are able. And we want those same blessings for other people, especially our fellow Christians too, that they remain healthy, that in how we treat them, they are able to see themselves as the creations of God that they truly are. Choosing what is best for ourselves, and best for others, because in that word best, we remember what God has given us. Absolutely his best by sending us Jesus. Absolutely the best by promising us the perfection of heaven. The best now and the best forever. Amen.
And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.